Pierre Torres is a uh, French, uh, in fact, he was a French oceanographer who, um, when the Arab Spring started in 2011, like many of us, he was very, very excited for these revolutionary events that uh, we were very hopeful back then about democratization in the Arab world. And um, Pierre, I believe initially before you went to Syria, you first went to Libya and Egypt uh, when the Arab Spring started. Yes, indeed, uh, that's it. I, I went there to, s to see those incredible revolutions who were completely unbelievable at the time. And uh, I arrived in, in Libya before it, the war started. So uh, I didn't expect it to, to, to see such, uh, such a violent situation. But when I was there, there was no point of moving away. So I spent two months there. And then, so, so what brought you to Syria? Uh, I went to Syria first time in 2012. Uh, in summer, um, I remember that during winter, I saw on TV the fall of uh, Baba Hammer. And after uh, Syria get kind of a, a black dawn, there was nothing going out, uh, out of the country. So um, in my opinion, there was major lack of information there that the reason why I went there in uh, in summer um, end of spring beginning of summer 2012 and uh, after that there was again a lot of journalists yes um, I, if we all recall people were very excited at the beginning uh, in the uh, about the um, the um, uh, protests in Syria but the world lost interest rather quickly or to, to rather large extent. So you, you started working as a freelancer for some uh, French uh, publications and media. And then, so I, I, I believe you were, you were kidnapped in June 2013. How, how did this come about, your, your abduction? Okay, I'm, between 2012 2013 I, I studied some philosophy to get some tool to understand this very very special situation and in uh, spring 2013 I went to several places first time in uh, in Kurdish area in Syria and then in uh, in the city of Raqqa uh, I went there because um, the city wa has been fled the 3rd of March 2013 so it was uh, free for a few months. I went at the end of May, and uh, I was assessing on what was going on in the city. And the situation was really interesting, way more complex than uh, I could imagine. Um, there was a lot of groups, a lot of uh, um, free army or uh, jihadist groups but also a lot of um, activists. And, um, and for me, it was very, very important to report on that because at that time already, uh, the newspaper were writing about a caliphate in Raqqa and that was not the case at all. And a few days, just to give you a picture, a few days before my abduction, uh, huge demonstration started everywhere in the city uh, against in, in Raqqa, in Raqqa. Yeah, in the city of Raqqa against uh, ISIS. So um, you, we have to keep in mind that uh, people there uh, were not supporters of ISIS at all. Uh, I mean, other groups were sometimes um, Islamist as well, but different way of being Islamist, uh, by a different way. And, um, and they were more or less supported by the population, but ISIS was clearly not. Yes, just in case people don't know, Raqqa is now the de facto capital of the Islamic State. All the horrific videos we've seen of, of beheadings and of the Jordanian pilot being burned in a cage and videos yesterday of Kurdish prisoners in a cage are in Raqqa. And as Pierre points out, 
up until the Islamic State captured Raqqa, the population there was very anti-Islamic State and holding demonstrations against them. So one can only imagine the horrific um, terror they live under now in the Islamic State. So, Pierre, when you were, after you were taken, um, what was your emotional feeling? Did you, were you alone? Did you, uh, when did you first realize that other people had been kidnapped from uh, France and other Western countries? Uh, we realized it by the time uh, I was put together um, with uh, Nicolas Hénin, um, I mean, two weeks after my abduction, and then sent to another jail in uh, Aleppo. And few by few, uh, we were joined by other Westerners, mainly journalists and NGO workers, who were kidnapped all over the country um, in the liberated area. And it continued almost all the time, even after uh, winter 2012, 2013, when uh, the Islamic State start to struggle uh, in a military way with all the other rebel groups. And uh, yeah, we were kind of desperate to see this group growing and growing to reach more than 20 people. And I understand that the um, British hostages were, um, that the people, let's say, looking after them, i.e. abusing them and, and kidnapping them um, or guarding them, were themselves uh, British citizens who had joined the Islamic State. And for you are one of four French hostages, and from what I understand, French citizens or French or Belgium citizens were also guarding you and communicating with you. Um, that's correct, yes? Uh, I will only talk about the, the French one, because they are the only one I, I'm sure about. There were yeah, some French and Belgium citizens. I saw a lot of them, I can say more than 10 of them. And there were also other nations. I mean, it was impressive to see how many nations were there. Um, there were people from all Western nations, and a lot, a lot of people were coming from North Africa, especially Tunisia as well. Yeah. And one of your fellow hostages who was released, um, Nicola Henin, he has identified the, the killer, the terrorist, who shot four people dead at the Brussels Jewish Museum last year as one of the same people who had been one of his captors in Syria. Is, is that your recollection too? Um, yes, indeed. Uh, we were held for a time by um, couples of guards, and uh, this person was one of them, and he spent a lot of time uh, to talk with us. Did you have the opportunity to ask your, I don't know if they're citizens, but people who grew up in France or Belgium or indeed here in Switzerland, French speakers grew up in not so different uh, circumstances than you grew up, why were they doing this? What were they doing um, trying to go into another country and trying to form some kind of Islamic state? In fact, they uh, generally they, they talk about that by themselves. I didn't have to ask about. And it was very surprising because uh, it was very rarely um, something religious Generally, it was very political, and I remember uh, one day there, there was a French guy who compared himself to, um, uh, I think you say in English, International Brigade, Les, Les Brigades yeah. Internationales. From, from the Spanish Civil War. Yes, yeah, so, who, who, who uh, fight in Spain, and my father came from Spain at that time, so it's kind of related story. And it was very weird to use this comparison because those guys were all more or less communist and for, uh, I mean, for a Muslim, a communist is kind of the absolute evil. It's the, the worst kufar you can imagine, uh, the most unbelievable you can imagine. So um, those people in, uh, by many ways, in, in their way of being Muslim, were very Westerners. I understand that, uh, that there were 23 different Western hostages kept um, at different times. And uh, 
some or all of them were tortured and, and treated very badly. And I've spoken to Pierre yesterday and before, and, and we don't want to go into detail about that out of respect for them and out of respect for their families. But you, as I understand it, have spoken um, to the families of some of the British and Americans who were beheaded after your release. I, I should just point out that Pierre was released in June 2013. I was released in uh, sorry, April. 14. Sorry, sorry, April 2014. You were kidnapped in June 2013. No, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then that summer, in, in last August, uh, in fact, I'd just like to name them for, for their memory. They're the American journalists James Foley and Stephen Satloff and an aid worker, Peter Kasich, and British aid workers, Alan Henning and David Haynes. All of them were beheaded one by one with, with choreographed videos and so on. Another woman, Kayla Muller, died, we don't know how. And one of the reasons that I believe that Pierre doesn't want to go into too much detail is at least one other British hostage, John Cantley, is still there. and we for various reasons, don't want to give away detailed information. But ca can you tell us, um, um, did you speak with the families of Stephen Sotloff and, and Jim Foley and so on after your release? Yes, uh, I did. In fact, um, uh, Stephen, for example, uh, uh, used me as a message carrier for his family. And he had like personal message for different member of his family. So it was the only way of doing it because there was no way of writing anything. So the only thing I can keep with me was my memories. Because I believe that you were given about 24 hours notice that you would be released before you were released. So they had an opportunity to give messages to their family through you. Um, also, am I right in thinking that even though there's a raging civil war going on in Syria, the uh, kidnappers, the hostage takers, still had communication. They were able to email the families of some of the hostages to demand ransoms. Is that right? Yeah, that's true. And uh, if for most of the hostages, the negotiation were dealt either by the state, either by the organization, uh, one of uh, the hostage was freed uh, through his family. Yes, ju just in case people don't know, the British and American governments um, have been very, very strict about not uh, negotiating in any way and also about not allowing the families to even publicize that their children or brothers or brothers were um, being held hostage. It's a, there were hostages also from Germany and Italy and Spain and some other countries, Denmark and so on. And it's a little bit different situation with the Europeans. Um, are you... Would you even criticize maybe the American or British governments for not doing more to save their citizens? Uh, yes, uh, I will really, really criticize those governments. I will not criticize them on their strategy. It's their business. And uh, it's not uh, up to me to judge on what they have to do. Uh, but um, uh, United States are spending a lot of money and energy for their outside intelligence CIA, uh, way more than France or Spain or all, basically all the other countries of the world. So they, they didn't do the job, that's it. I, I, I'm not saying they should have done that or that. And I agree with them that it's not my business to, to go into what they did as long as they do the job, and now they, they fail, and, uh, and yeah. Um, I understand that in addition to sometimes horrific treatment in your 10 months in captivity, obviously you didn't have access to watch TV or the internet. Did you have maybe some books to read or something to occupy the time? Yeah, sometimes we had books, but they were not sorted out. There was many kind of, of, of books. Some were very extreme into violence. Some were very interesting and, uh, and full of very rich ideas about Islam. Um, and we had also, now I remember it, some video clip as well 
um, shows in some yeah. and th th They made some videos of you, but those videos were never released later, if I understood correctly. Uh, uh, yeah, also, no, I, I mean, uh, we, we show some video show clips. Show some videos to uh, they, um, Yes, they, of propaganda. Yeah. And yeah, they shot also some some video for several reasons. And I understand that you and Nicolas Henin, one of the other French uh, hostages, in order to fill up your time, you you have written a book in your heads together. That's correct. That's and correct. it will be published actually next month. Um, Nicolas has written the uh, words, and you've done the pictures. Maybe you can just tell us in French the the title. Yes, it's about a hedgehog named. Uh, Father Hedgehog, it's him, and the title is Will uh, um, Daddy Hedgehog Go Back Home? So it's a, it's a kind of allegorical children's story. I've had a read of it this morning. It will be published in French next month and hopefully in English and other languages later. So it was literally written in captivity to pass the time. Um, do we have a five more minutes? No? OK. So um, um, is there any final thoughts you'd like to give? At one of the people you're with, John Cantley, who's a British uh, journalist or photographer, is now being used, you may have seen, by ISIS to deliver kind of propaganda reporting from Raqqa. So we know that this is, in fact, keeping them alive, be, be, uh, doing this. Is there any messages or thoughts or, or uh, about either the hostages that died or about John that you'd like to share? Um, yes. Um, we heard this morning a speech from uh, Marcus Learning, who advised us to look uh, precisely at the big picture because it's often more complicated than we thought uh, in the first look. And that's what we have to do with IAS because nowadays it's threatening everyone. They want to look very, very uh, tough, and they are. And uh, one of our best um, shield, one of uh, the most, uh, uh, the, the worst enemies they have are the Kurdish. Uh, I mean, more or less under the influence of uh, YPG. And we are helping them massively to, to struggle against IAS. But we have to keep in mind that uh, even though there are very, very good points, uh, I mean, 50% women everywhere, that's amazing, especially in this part of the world. And they use violence um, in a very careful way, generally, especially uh, with Westerners. Uh, but they are also very, very far from being a democratic organization. And... Um, a friend of mine named uh, Masoud Hamid is a journalist, is a French Syrian journalist. Now he's doing kind of very interesting stuff. I think he's in Iraq nowadays uh, in the front against the Islamic State. And his brother is an activist. His name is uh, Amir Hamid. And he was taken more than one year ago by YPG, who didn't give any news about him uh, since that time. And they even denied they have him. But by the time we get several witnesses who uh, can testify showing, showing him excuse me, in, in the jail of YPG, being bad, uh, bad, uh, getting bad treatment, and we have uh, to ask those people who ask for support, who ask for being recognized as a non-terrorist um, organization to, um, to clarify the situation uh, with opposants like uh, Amir Hamid so, in their yeah. area. So, yes, we should also ask the Kurds who are now our allies to behave in as democratic way as possible. Anyway, Pierre, thank you, and thank you for doing it in English. By the way, Pierre learnt English from the American and British hostages in his 10 months. That's why he now speaks English, and we should also give a thought to those poor people. So thank you, Pierre. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Pierre and Tom. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, the next